a record. We are going to be recording this session. Welcome to Leaders Breaking the Bias. Um, in behalf of Women Empowerment uh, and Diverse Employees of Portland, we welcome the community and panelists this morning. Um, so we had years in the pandemic, millions of women have been um, out of the workforce throughout the United States. And um, by COVID-19 or downshifting careers or leaving their jobs. So uh, women have come a long way, but there is still much work to do when addressing the crisis with childcare pay equity. Um, I need to, uh, for a respectful ple uh, people-centered culture, elimination of stereotypes and microaggressions and the common biases women face at work, such as barriers, due to likability, uh, caregiving expectations and intersectionality, which can be unconscious and often unreasonable. So we now welcome a panel of leaders and look forward to learning of how to break the bias from their wisdom and journey. So I would like to welcome our panelists and um, I would like them to introduce themselves and um, please stay for and your pronouns if you want. And, Suleva, can you introduce yourself first? Sorry. I, I apologize, yes. Um, my name is Suleima Figueroa, and I'm uh, we, um, one of the WE members, and um, I'm facilitating this meeting with Anna Profi and Linda. Linda? Oh, Anna? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Anna Profi, she, her pronouns, and I'm with the Women's Empowerment Steering Committee, and thank you so much for being here. Linda? Good morning. I'm Linda Novitsky, also on the Women's Empowerment Steering Committee, she, her pronouns. Thanks for coming, everyone. Pass it back to you, Sulema. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I apologize for that. Um, yes, uh, so I would like now our panelists to introduce themselves, and we can uh, just, um, you can take turns if you would like. So who would like to go first? Hi, my name is Tiffany Penson. Um, she, her pronouns or whatever works, Tiffany <laughs> works. Um, I am the new people and culture strategist leading the people and culture team in the Bureau of Human Resources. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tiffany. I guess I can go next. Hello, everyone. My name is Nia Stepanovic. I use her and she pronouns. Um, I work with Bureau of Environmental Services. I'm engineer three there. Really excited to see such a huge group and turn out. Thank you, Mia. Hi, all. I'm Gabe Sommer, um, Gabe or Gabriel. I use she and her pronouns. I'm the director of the Portland Water Bureau, and I'm excited and thankful um, to you for putting this on. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh, Amy? Amy. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amy James Neal. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a little bit of an outlier here because I'm not with the city of Portland, but I work very closely with the city of Portland. I'm with Portland Community College. I'm not on the college side. I'm over in the planning and capital construction department. And there I serve as the workforce and contracting equity manager. And just FYI, I'm a carpenter by trade. So that very much informs uh, my work over at Portland Community <laughs> College. Thank you, panelists. Um, I welcome you to our um to our event and, and now I will actually go ahead and read the first question. And um, so this is the first question. Women, women, women experience gender bias and stereotyping. People think differences affects leadership role. Others associate leadership with assertiveness, aggression, competitiveness, competitiveness. I try to say that word correctly. Um, dominance, independence, and self-resilience. This is typically seen as male trait, therefore to be accepted as leader, women must walk a fine line between two opposite sets of expectation. Be a feminine woman and exhibit male traits. Can you talk about your experience with your journey to becoming a leader? And did you change your styles? 
What is your advice to women facing barriers such as gender bias, microaggressions, and or no path to a management of leadership position? Um, would like to go first. Just gonna give you a choice. I might probably call uh, Tiffany. Hi, so I think a lot about when we have these conversations about women and how they're treated um, in the workplace. And so um, one of the things that I really like to focus on and how I like to support women um, is I feel the most important thing is to openly support women through mentorship, sharing your stories, having transparent and real conversations, providing regular constructive criticism and giving praise for their efforts and their successes. Um, have I personally had to change my style because I'm a woman? Not necessarily so, but I may have had to change my style. Well, I know I've had to change my style because of the color of my skin. So I often don't really get to think of things as, I wonder if they're doing this because I'm a woman, because the color of my skin and my characteristics um, are focused on, is the, is the, this is the focus. And so it, 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 I often never even think about, um, is this happening because I'm a woman? So I just wanna put that out there because that's where my answers and the conversations are gonna come from. Um, I also think it's important for us to be willing to use our voices and power to make a difference for women and young people in the workplace. I never sugarcoat what I'm thinking. Um, I, I, I am clear on my reality and I oftentimes when I'm dealing with adversity or lack of access to education or opportunities or poor management, I go to the, my immediate that um, being a woman is secondary. In my world, it is my skin color and ethnicity. So I'm just really honest and transparent and I operate from that standpoint. Um, I think I'll stop there and jump in. And did I answer the question? Yes, you did, uh, Tiffany, thank you. Maybe um, I can just, oh, somebody else wanna speak? Okay. I was just gonna um, jump in on uh, to, to what Tiffany said. It definitely resonates with me. I think um, one of the most important things that we can do as leaders is to be authentic. Um, we, in a lot of ways, um, at least according to society, we sort of made it, right? We're in leadership positions. Um, and so we have the opportunity to, um, to pull people up to where we are. And I think that that's an important responsibility of being um, a leader and, and a woman, a, a leader really of, of any gender, um, of any race. I think it's really important to look at um, the shoulders that we have stood on to get to where we are and to be that authentic leader and to look at um, people who are still traveling on that journey and determine how we can support them, um, which is, uh, I know a lot of what the, the other questions will focus on. Um, but I think just to, to Tiffany's point, it's really important to be um, our authentic selves uh, because we don't, we don't face as much pushback. I don't, I don't want to say that we don't face any pushback because I think we've all experienced that in every position that we've been in and every space that we occupy. Um, but we, we do have some privileges in, in terms of where we are in the space that we occupy. And so um, being able to model the kind of leader that we want to see in our organization, I think, is important to people who have not seen that leadership style or who, who don't um, see that that resonates. So if we can show this is the kind of leader that I am and it, it works for our organization, then I think we um, carve out space for other people to pursue type of leadership, even if it hasn't been modeled um, in other areas for them. So what is your advice um, for women facing barriers such as gender bias and microaggressions or paths management leadership positions? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the advice is to speak out about it. I think, um, as Tiffany was saying, this is something where it, it often just gets sort of brushed under the carpet or expected. Um, and that's that's really sad because um, if we can talk about it and say that this does happen, this happens every day in microaggressions, it happens every day in bigger aggressions, uh, and we can bring that up, then I think our, our leadership um, team for whichever organization we're in can start to address that. So I guess one, one piece of advice is don't assume that everyone knows that this is happening. It's really important to bring up those is. Um, and um, I think it's really important for leaders to understand um, that, to, to take it seriously and not just view it as complaining. Um, because I think once we get shut down, if you if you bring something up and it doesn't get um, a careful airing or viewing, um, you're much less likely to bring that up. It caused you harm in your, your personal um, So that's real. And if we as leaders can, can take those um, concerns seriously and start to sort of um, gather them, right? So in, in these one-offs, it might not seem like such a big deal, but if we can kind of um, take those in and summarize them into things that are happening all over the city or, um, or in our organization, I think that can be helpful to start realizing how we can change things. Thank you, Gabe. Um, Mia? Uh, thank you so much. I, I relate to a lot that has been already said. Uh, I guess I have a short story. It, this exact question actually happened to me not too long ago. I was summoned uh, by my superior, or I guess superior, superior, and um, given advice that maybe my career within the city would be better if I wasn't as bold as I am in the way that I um, move <laughs> through my work. And so um, I, I kind of stood back and tried to figure out, is bold a compliment? <laughs> or is bold saying, uh, Mia, you're really acting, you're, the way you, you make decisions and the way you communicate doesn't fit your exterior appearance. <laughs> I think I got it down to that point. And so I stood back and I tried to figure out, all right, how do you, how do you respond to that? When someone tells you, all right, yeah, you gotta be a little less bold. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, thank you so much for your uh, advice. I have a lot of hair. Did you mean like bold, bald or bold? <laughs> And so that person just kind of looked at me and started to laugh, right? <laughs> um, so um, I think the key is building uh, alliances in your career, anywhere you go. So building a network of support, coworkers, friends, because these things happen, right? And they happen to us in like the most um, unpredictable ways. And you know, we feel cut, you know, right down, down your stomach, right? And you just kind of stand there and you absorb what's being said to you. And, and a knee-jerk reaction would be like an emotional one, right? And I think the key is to kind of learn how to maintain the self-composure and then kind of back out of the situation. No. Kind of engage with your sea of supporters, with your network system. And really try to go back and like understand like what is the best way to approach this situation because a lot of times you know i see our sisters being cut in the meetings and and um it's sometimes the situations are delicate and sometimes it's, it warrants kind of stepping back and reapproaching the situation so I'm really excited about meetings such as this, where we we build that sea of support, you know, that sea of strength that we can call our sister and say, guess what happened to me? And then they can say, no way, that is absolutely not okay, you know? And then you can strategize really how to change the culture in which we live, right? Because it doesn't happen by a training. It happens through those like, small interactions that sometimes some cut less than others but it's us and it's the women and sister before us 
that are really those pioneers and we really shape the future for our sisters to come, right? And so I, I'm really excited about opportunities such as this where we band together, no matter, you know, and then we kind of, we are the change agents, right? So I really appreciate the question and made me remember the event. Thank you, Mia. Thank you very much. Um, Amy? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit different tack uh, to answering this question. Instead of uh, about my experience, uh, I'm gonna talk about what I observed, uh, particularly as I you know, came from just a, an entry level job up into a leadership position. And what I've observed is that it's not really the, the it's not really the responsibility of the women for to fend for themselves out in the field. I, I find that um, I find that problematic. I feel like leaders, uh, managers in, in, in all of our agencies, you know, across the region and across this nation, lack the cultural competency at gatekeeper roles to really recognize the full spectrum of what talent looks like. I think that's the problem. We are all, not all the same. And that is our strength. You know, we come from different cultures. We have different lived experiences particularly if we fall outside uh, dominant culture, we have vastly different experiences with access. So I'll, I'll, I'll too tell a short story. You know, we are socialized differently. You know, job interviews are gatekeeper roles and or panelists on job inter, uh, for job interviews are gatekeeper roles. And men are socialized to own their accomplishments. You know, much, much like Mia was saying, you know, men uh, brag about them. You know, they are perceived as accomplished and driven and ambitious. But if women brag about their accomplishments, we're perceived as being arrogant, right? It's just part of our training. It's part of the culture. It's, it's part of you know, living in the United States of America that women are socialized differently than men. And if the people in, people in those gatekeeper roles do not have the cultural competency to understand that when they are approaching an interview, you are missing out on talent. You know, so if a, if, if a woman goes into a job with the same level of experience that a man goes into to a job interview, Women are socialized to not brag. So they're not gonna go over the top about their accomplishments and the men are. The interviewers, you know, particularly if they are a majority panel, you know, if they're, if they're white men, they may perceive that woman candidate as being less uh, applicable for the job. You know, they, they may see one candidate as being more qualified. It's not about their qualifications, it's that lack of cultural competency. So the solution in my estimation is it, it lives with managers. You know, it, it solution is representation in spaces where decisions are being made about who brings value to the team and what value looks like. You know, like being a team player is different across cultures and patterns of speech and hairstyles are different across cultures. Expressions of confidence are different across cultures. And if you don't have representation in those spaces that recognize that through their lived experience, we are, locking out uh, incredibly talented and skilled um, folks from, from our uh, leadership roles. So if they don't have, if, if these gatekeepers, these interviewers don't have the cultural literacy to, to really be able to identify the way that occupational segregation and gender socialization, all of those things show up in a way an applicant presents themselves, you know, again, we're missing out on talent. So it just continues to replicate itself. You know, it's just like, Women are, we know are locked out of these roles and it's because they don't have the skills, you know? So it's, it's a circle, you know, women have been locked out. They don't have the skills. The job description requires the skills. And so they don't apply for these jobs. And so, you know, the panelists are just like, oh, well, you know, we tried to hire women, but nobody signed up for them. So I guess we'll just have to hire another white man. And then it goes back to the top of the circle. The women are locked out. It just keeps replicating itself. It goes around and around. So the way we interrupt that is by centering an explicitly race and gender conscious approach to interviewing people. And through like, I think what Tiffany was saying that, that uh, intentional mentorship, you know, like um, centering race and gender conscious mentorship is critical to breaking this inequity regime that we keep creating through the same circle of like, well, they don't have the skills. Well, why don't they have the skills? I don't know, let's hire a white guy. Why guy doesn't recognize the skills? This whole thing just keeps replicating itself. So it's the gatekeeper rules that I wanna focus on rather than um, hardening up our women down in the field to, to fend for themselves out here. Thank you very much, Amy. I really appreciate that. And thank you, uh, Tiffany, Gabe, and Mia. 
I really appreciate all your responses. Um, Anne, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sulema. Thank you, panel. So I'm going to post the second question in the chat. And hopefully we'll get to the third one, but if we run out of time, we can get answers from our panelists via Outlook and share it with everybody. So here's the question and I'll read it out loud. So people make assumptions about women at work and as leaders based on their stereotypical roles in society. Often women are limited in their advancement or worse, never even given an opportunity because of bias. Even more worrisome, some of the bias that people have toward women is unconscious, implicit. We don't even know we're carrying it. This implicit bias shape women worldviews and can profoundly affect how welcoming and open a workplace is to them. We want folks to feel welcome and included and valued. And that's for all people, right? For our sisters, it is so important. So the two questions for you, what has limited your career advancement? What can our male leaders do to support women progress? Thank you. And I think we can start with Tiffany again. Okay, so in thinking about <clears throat> what has limited my career advancement, so I'm gonna have the real honest conversation with everyone and I'm speaking for myself and I don't want people to get offended, but I'm gonna speak the truth. White women have played more of a role in limiting my career advancement than a white man. Um, I think about, I've had a lot of positive experiences at the city I've worked for, um, some great white women, currently Kathy Bless, the director of BHR is awesome and really gets these conversations. So, um, but in the past I've worked with some great white women but I've also had some really bad experiences, the most traumatic experiences from white women in leadership um, that I work for. So I want to, be clear about that and point that out. For me, as a black woman, the white man hasn't impacted me like the white woman. And so I want to, I want to be really honest about that conversation and um, what has happened in my life in my career is not been relegated to the white man. Um, with in saying that, I think that women in general, they have a responsibility as well, and that is to be good to each other. There is enough adversity out there there is um, for, I really only hear white women in my circles talk about white men. In my circle of black women, we usually are talking about the barriers that white women in the workplace put before us. And I really think that comes from when people are mistreated over and over again, I think that they carry that. I think they carry that trauma and they don't always, they behave from a survival standpoint versus a thriving standpoint. And sometimes when you're surviving, you mistreat people unintentionally or intentionally. So when I think about limitations to uh, uh, career opportunities, I don't necessarily think of the white man. Now, the role that white men, if we're gonna talk about it, and because I've been on, I've experienced a lot of different things, is 
I have empathy, right? It may not be my, or I may not originally go to, oh, the white man gets in my way, but I have empathy for white women when they talk about it because I know how I've been treated by white women and I know how I have been treated by the cup because of the color of my skin. So I have empathy. And when I think about what men can do, well, first of all, I feel like they just need to listen to women <laughs> and listen to their voices. Um, I also think the one thing they can do is use their power to provide access to opportunity for women. Once they open the door, then their work really consists of understanding who we are, supporting our needs that are identified by us, and requiring, um, requiring us to requiring us to bring our authentic selves to the table and also just trusting us. Sometimes men can just react um, uh, in a protection mode, right? To protect their kingdom, especially when they come across women who are strong and women who are very um, skilled and knowledgeable. And instead of reacting to protect the kingdom, be thinking, how can I really support her? If I show her the support that she needs, that she has earned, that is due to her, we will all look better in the workplace. So that's kind of how I think about it. Thank you, Tiffany. Mia, would you like to go next? Hey, thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I um, had a prepared answer, but um, I, I agree. Um, it's so unfortunate, and I think that hurts the most when, when I see or where I observe women being cruel to other women, <laughs> especially in the male-dominated uh, industries and trades. And I think um, it hurts so much that because you understand that both of those women are victims. And both of those women feel like they have to fight each other in order to succeed <laughs> in the game. And instead, instead of they can band together, then they're twice as strong and more capable. Um, the, you, Tiffany, you touched exactly on it. Like the diversity is the key to success and fortification of the castles and diversity in race, diversity in gender, diversity in lived experiences, diversity in nationalities. Uh, we, we represent a very wide, uh, wide uh, communities inside of the city of Portland, right? And the truth is until we really look like these communities we serve, we are always going to be lacking on those levels of services that we deliver. And I think also um, talking about those, um, those core values that we hold, it's really, I find it very challenging to change people's core values, to really un make them understand that um, the diversity is the key and because when you get into those situations in interview panels and they're hiring for the best candidate, right? And they've been told to hire for the best candidate, the men, unless they explicitly told hire women would hire people that look like them, another man. And it's like, how do we move to that point where they're, in, they're not threatened and they're in a safe zone and a safe zone is a female candidate? Um, so, so looking back in my career, I think I have been limited in a way. Um, I, a while back, I went for a promotion and I uh, actually got really close to another man candidate. I think I was only one point away on a hundred point scale and was told that the supervisor was asked to hire a man, a man's replacement, a man, right? And, um, 
it, it's like, how do we move away from that so that doesn't happen to the next, you know, sister in line? Um, and the only way we can do that is to support each other. Um, and so um, I, I do my best to reach out to other fellow sisters around me and support them in any way, even sometimes if it's just you know, yes, I, I saw that. Yes, that's not fair. I agree with you, you know. Um, and I encourage especially women, especially on this panel and everybody else who are in even higher positions to do that more often. Because um, if you were harmed, don't be the person who harms others. Don't be the one that kind of perpetuates that circle of harm. Thanks. Thank you, Mia. Amy, can you go next? Sure. Yeah, this has been such a such a useful discussion, and I, I just want to also reiterate that that I come specifically from the construction trade, which is a really different beast than um, than the, the the place I find myself now in terms of the hierarchy and who has power and who doesn't have power. So that that informs uh, that that informs my my view of things. So in terms of what got in my way. Uh, because I come from the construction culture, which is um, only 2.9% women, um, it was men's behavior that got in my way. You know, everyone thinks, oh, women can't do construction work. It's too heavy. It's too dirty. It's too whatever. <laughs> None of those things were true. The only thing that got in my way was the behavior of men and a culture that was based and built around the relationships between white men, which is really, really different from the way women relate to each other and people of color relate to each other. So um, again, being solutions-based, um, what I want to think about is um, where do we go from here? You know, like I, I know that I came from male dominated culture. I know that culture is going to take a really long time to shift. So how, how do we approach it? You know, like where do we start? And I think the first thing is to address a sense of belonging. It's the sense of belonging. You know, it's not equity. It's not inclusion. Those things are different for me than a sense of belonging. You know, when you ask folks to assimilate, you know, you've got this culture and we know who's locked out of the culture, wherever you are in your life, you know, whatever job you're in or whatever industry you're in, you know, who's being locked out. It may be different from what I'm seeing from my vantage point, but you know, who's being locked out. Are you asking the folks that you want to bring in? Are you asking them to assimilate into that culture to, to, to leave parts of them behind? Or are you creating a space where workers know that the place is better because they are here and that they are encouraged to take up space. That's what I wanna see. That's what I wanna work toward. It's not just asking folks to you know, be more like a, you know, I, I, it's already been mentioned a couple of times, like I had to assimilate. No, 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 that's, that's, that cuts off um, some really important, you know, it cuts off our lived experience. It cuts off in some cases, our core identities, our life situations, you know, inclusion and belonging are different. And if, um, if you linked job performance back to retention, so that is to say if, 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 if an agency or a workplace really wants to bring in talent, they really want to extend access to people, then the first thing to do is to, to that, that cultural literacy, again, piece. Managers need to have that cultural literacy, that cultural competency, and they need to represent the communities that we seek to serve. And, um, and this is the, the more advanced part of that is linking job performance back to retention. So once you have the training, once you have the awareness, you know, and once you get some, some of the, 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 the diversity that we seek to draw off of the skill sets in place, retention needs to be part of assessing the success of a supervisor. So it's not like you just come in with the technical skills to do your job, you know, push these papers over here, move this, you know, pile of lumber over here. It's more about, it's, it's that, you know, you do have to have the technical skills, but you also have to have the cultural literacy. Like that is part of serving humans is, is understanding our differences and how, how we all bring, like we really need to bring those differences to our jobs, not be asked to assimilate into something that was never created to accommodate us. So, you know, if you wanna support women in the workplace, you have to make sure that the workplace is built around women, you know, the way women interact and the way women lead and the way women interface with each other. And if you're asking them to assimilate into an environment that's really antiquated, you know, and it was maybe, I don't know, it was built in the fifties or something, 
And that never really truly accounted for the what women's lives look like, you know, regardless of uh, the demographic that they come from. It, it does not, it simply doesn't accommodate them. And that's what I saw in construction is that the, the way um, the culture was built was the, around the way white men interact with each other. So sense of belonging is big, you know, it requires recalibrating and scrutinizing every way in which we operate operationalize exclusion into you know, hiring practices and skills transfer and what behavior is acceptable. All of those things are, are, are culture-based. So the, what we know is that success happens through connections, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know, it's all those things. So if it is indeed who you know, and success, you know, your, your ability to, to move into to access, you know, that, that access happens through relationships. But if you're not included, you know, if you're not part of the culture of belonging, you're on the margins of that dominant culture, then you might lack the access, you know, to the power of what happens through these relationships. So if everything is about relationships and you're sort of on the margins of interfacing with the dominant culture, then you lose access to those, um, those, those abilities to, to move up through the ranks. And I don't know, this, this could affect your advancement. So I, I feel like the culture of belonging is something that, or sense of belonging is something that we really need to examine. What are we asking people to, when they come into the job site, what are they asking them to do? Are they coming into an office place? Are we asking them to fit in, fit into like something that's this narrow? Or are we busting down those walls and letting people establish the new normal that better accommodates us as individuals and, and brings that, that robustness um, to decision making that that we know we get when we have folks with dissimilar lived experiences in a room together is better better problem solving. Thank you so much, Amy. That was amazing. Gabe, I Thank know you're you. amazing too. Oh, <laughs> well, that's kind of what I wanted to to bring to this part of the discussion. Is we've talked about you know who holds us back in these positions, and we've talked about. Um, men and culture and other women. Um, but I just want to just bring to the conversation, it's also ourselves. Um, and so I don't know how, how many um, of us are familiar with imposter syndrome, um, but it's real. So this is the idea that I'm not good enough, right? You see someone who has the same skills as you and you think, oh, they're fantastic. Um, but I, I don't see that in myself. Um, I feel like at any moment, someone is going to be like, why is she here? Why is she in the room? Um, and why did we give her that job? And she can't really do that. And so I'll just say that um, it, it, it's, it's something that I live with and, um, and I see affecting a lot of people. And so um, I think that's an important piece too, is that um, we, we are good enough. <laughs> we are um, smart enough and capable of, enough to be in these positions of leadership. Um, and I know that that's really hard to internalize when you're getting told like Mia, you know, well, you're one point below or, or um, that's really hard to, to take on board. And especially when I think um, women have, um, have that sort of sense um, and, and conditioning um, from society and culture to, to question and to really critique ourselves, our bodies, um, our, what we know, our knowledge, all of this uh, is something that we put um, that really fine lens on. And so um, I think of what advice you would give your best friend in those situations, because we don't always treat ourselves as our best friends. So um, we can be really harsh to ourselves, but what would we tell our, our best friend? We would tell her that she's um, strong enough and capable enough. We would point out that great point that she, um, she made in a conversation or the awesome PowerPoint that she created or how she changed someone's mind or how compassionate she was, we would find all of those really um, ways of being excellent. And we would point those out to her if she was not seeing them herself. So that's one thing that I think we can, um, we can do. And um, I think this ties a little bit into the, the next question, but um, I, I really like um, this idea of explaining and being really transparent about why you are doing things as a leader or wherever, leading from wherever you sit in an organization. So um, there are really good reasons for gender diversity. It is not just, it's the right thing to do. And I think a lot of us kind of fall back on that. Um, there's some great data about how you get better results, better productivity, better economics, better societal outcomes um, when you have um, and 
diversity in your organization. So make sure that people know all of those reasons um, so that you're not just kind of telling people you have to do this because it's the right thing to do or it's the politically correct thing to do. Um, I think that's another piece. And then um, I also think to support people in the situation is to document your expectations and your goals. And this might be um, more for people who are in a leadership position, but hold your leaders to account on this. So no one is going to be able to do this um, perfectly. Uh, uh, like um, Amy was saying, you know, this is culture that we have inherited um, and that has been around for, for decades. We're not expecting that this is going to change overnight. Uh, it's a process. But if you don't have those goals and milestones, and if you don't hold your organization accountable to that, you're not going to see things changing, which is really important. We need those wins. Um, make sure that your, your equity plan is used and it's visible. Um, and I think at this point, at least for the city, all of our equity plans have um, racial and gender goals. So make, if, if it doesn't, ask why. Um, and make sure that they're referred to frequently and tie that performance goals um, so that everyone has a stake in that, so that you know what it is that you need to do to make that um, plan a reality. Um, and then I, I just, I have to say on the hiring process, because I think it is so, so important, really examine your hiring process and understand why do you have the requirements for the preferred skill sets that you have for any particular role. Um, very basics, are you using gendered language? Um, so don't do that. <laughs> um, use plain language and just really look at what are your recruiting practices? Where do you look for applicants? Um, because depending on where you're looking, you're not gonna find a segment of the population. Um, how do you use that data from the applicant pools uh, that you've had before to look at um, how you can get to better gender balance um, and, and racial um, balance so that we can look like the communities that we serve? Um, if you if you post the same job description for the the person who just left and you just post their job description without looking at it, you're not going to attract new applicants. You're going to attract the applicants that um, that look like the person that just left. Um, and then I just can't. I just love the the idea and can't emphasize it enough. Of um, do, who's on your who's on your hiring panel and how have they been trained? Do you have diverse voices on that panel? Do you have a large enough panel to have that range of perspectives so that you as a hiring manager or whoever you're supporting as a hiring manager has all that information? Um, and then how can you make the process useful and enjoyable? I'm just gonna say enjoyable for your candidates because if we're not doing that, then we are not gonna have um, candidates make it through the process. And I think we've all been a part of a failed recruiting process where, where someone says, you know what? Just the way that you've done this, either it doesn't work for my time, um, my timeline, or it just tells me that I'm not going to be happy in this position. So um, both sides have to get to yes. And I feel like if you can create a hiring process that's fair and transparent and supportive, you are much more likely to attract the candidates that, that you want. And I think they're more likely to be women because they um, th that is an area where um, that, that we look at. Um, I, think, I think everyone does. I think it's a rising tide that lifts, lifts all boats, but I think it's an area where um, if you want women to come to your organization, you have to show them why they will be welcome there and why they won't just have to assimil assimilate, but why you are looking for that diversity. And, um, and then you have to nurture it when it gets to your, um, to your doorstep. You have to make sure that you're not just saying, great, we have all these diverse voices, we have ticked all of these boxes, um, but you're not actually welcome to share your true opinions and thoughts. Um, we didn't want that much diversity, right? And I think we've been in those seats where we feel, we feel that. Um, so if you can, um, I have lots more to say about hiring, but I think that's more in this, the next question. So maybe um, Anna and Zulema, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Gabe. I really Thank appreciate you so much. it. Thank you so much, everyone. Zulema, I posted the last question in the chat. I think we have enough time. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate all the panelists answering that question number two. Uh, question three. So here it is. All genders value work-life balance but there are organizations that still expecting they follow rigid work hours, structure and policies. Uh, this is the question. As a leader in the city of Portland, 
what are you doing to help women feel value, promote work life balance, develop leadership talent, and break the bias? Um, again, we're going to start with Tiffany. Hi, so I thought about this and I wanted, I even jotted down some points uh, to speak about because I'm usually just flying by the seat of my pants, but I wanted to make sure I drove home a few um, points. When I think about this, I think about an inclusive workplace and I think um, providing an inclusive workplace is really simple. The first thing we need to do is quit talking about it. We've got enough data, we know what needs to happen. So let's quit talking about it and put it into action. Um, currently, one of the things that we are doing is my role in, as people and culture strategists is to create a culture philosophy that operationalizes the city's core values of anti-racism, collaboration, communication, equity, fiscal responsibility, and transparency. The vision for this role came from the Chief Human Resources Officer, Kathy Bless. And so I say that because I think leaders at the top of the food chain, especially, they have to have a vision. They have to understand what is needed in an organization for an organization to thrive. Um, I feel it's also important to treat people how they want to be treated treated, create opportunities for flexibility to enable women to take care of their children and families. To me, this looks like focusing more on the work deliverables versus if they're sitting in their seats for eight hours. I am really about the work. Did you get the assignment done? I'm not about if you're sitting there for eight hours. So putting some thought around what does it look like, really look like to be flexible in the workplace. Um, be intentional about providing access to training and professional development. That is key. We often hear when there's opportunities for training or professional development, oh, well, we'll have to check our budget. Or if you're a smaller bureau, we don't have the budget for that. If you're a larger bureau, they usually have more lucrative budget, but this can't be based on budget. You have to, when you make that commitment to invest in your teams, in your employees, women, people of color, you have to carve out that budget. It is important. Um, another thing is build trust through transparent communication and clear expectations. You have to build trustful relationships with people and also make sure they understand what is expected of them. I often hear about people working through their whole six months of probation to find out on their last, their last evaluation that all these things were wrong. That doesn't work. You have to be honest with people and you have to be clear. Make sure that they're clear on, their, on the expectations and not hold back. Um, constructive criticism is important. I feel that it is important to start with trusting our employees instead of setting the tone, leading with the what if, I call those the what if rules. Well, what if I let them work remotely and they are not at their desk the whole eight hours? Or what if I do this? What if I do that? Why don't you lead with trust? until an employee gives you a reason not to trust them. But we need to shift that and lead with trust. Um, something that is critically important and that I was taught, raised when I was uh, growing up, leave your baggage at the door. Everybody has prejudices, opinions about people, ethnicity, gender, politics, religion. However, when you come into this workplace, you need to understand the expectations around how we treat people, how we perform work, how we are inclusive of all people and how we hold people accountable. And if you fail at these, then there are consequences. Um, our goal is to provide a workplace, like, like Amy talked about a sense of belonging, but a workplace of accountability, an authentic workplace, a real conversation workplace. And so um, in order to do this, 
you have to bring your real self, your authentic self to the table and you have to provide space for that. And if you, I would love to change hearts and minds. Um, that's the ultimate. How do we change people's hearts and minds around um, ethnicity, around women, around all of these issues? But when you're talking about the workplace, if I fail to change your heart and mind, what I want to make sure that you know, when you cross over a city threshold, this is what is expected of you. So that's pretty much how I think of it. And I think those are some key things that, that as leaders that we have to enforce. And those things have to come from the top, from the top of the organization. Everybody has to be clear on what is expected and the messaging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Really uh, excellent insight. Thank you. Um, you wanna, Gabe, wanna go next? Um, you know, I talked a lot about the, the hiring process because I think so much starts there. Um, it's our introduction to, uh, to our candidates. Um, and it also, uh, you know, we don't do hiring, each, each individual doesn't do hiring that much. And so it can be um, different. And I think an exciting way to participate and to bring in um, diversity, but we have to give people the training. We have to show them as Tiffany said, those expectations. Um, but then I also think, you know, in terms of an inclusive workplace, we've got to look at what does that mean once you're here? So um, I was in um, a meeting where uh, things got heated and someone started shouting. And I said, that's not how we treat each other, right? And they were interrupting, um, they were interrupting uh, actually um, a man but I think that it, that it often happens the other way, right? Where women get interrupted. And so I think that if you can um, be really clear with those meeting policies, what are our expectations um, of people in a meeting, you can change culture through that piece too. Um, I think, and this is hard at the, the city because we don't all have control over this, but I'm just gonna put it out into the universe. Um, we need to look at whether we have the right benefits. Um, so. I know that that's not something that we can all uh, change from where we sit, but um, there is a lot that we can do. Make sure that wherever you can give flexibility that you're offering that, as um, you said, it is much more about, um, are we meeting those? First of all, are, do people have performance um, levels and, and metrics so they know what is expected of them? So it's not a surprise. And if they do, then why do you care where they sit? doing that work? Why is that an, an important piece? Um, there's, there's really not much of our jobs that, um, that has that. And I think that has been kind of the silver lining of the pandemic as we've been able to see, you know what, I can do my job. Um, even if my, uh, I guess she was eight years old then, you know, is sneaking around on the floor and asking me questions. I actually can do that. Um, one of the uh, skill sets that I bring is multitasking. And so I can work in that way. Um, and I think that, that that representation matters, right? So I'm a parent, um, doesn't have to be that I'm a woman and a parent, but that's what I bring to this leadership role. Um, and it, it gave me an insight into what other parents are dealing with, particularly during this um, pandemic and with this trauma, um, but just generally. And um, I'm a parent of um, you know older elementary school kids, and I have people in my bureau who are parents of um, every age range. And so just give um, a, a quick shout out to Kristen Anderson and some of the other women in my bureau who have been really, really champions um, for parents during the pandemic for what, what do we need um, as caregivers? What do we need to, um, to be more flexible so that we can um, do all of the roles that are expected of us, not just um, our role in the eight hours that we're in the workplace. Um, and then I also think in terms of trainings, so, so important. Every engagement survey that we've ever done, training has been at the top. People want to know more. They want to, they see that as a key to advancement and I do too. Um, so why do people opt out of training? Either it's not offered because of budget like Tiffany was saying, um, or it's in conflict with something else that they need to do or they feel that they need to do or they don't wanna ask for that. So you have to, you have to look at that data. We have that data 
we're way past the point of being like, well, they didn't participate. I guess they didn't really care about this. Um, we have to understand our biases in terms of FaceTime, especially as we're going through this kind of revolution in terms of teleworkers. What does it mean if you don't see someone at their desk? Um, what does it mean for the person who's putting in the late hours? Maybe because they can, because they're not taking care of a, a family and doing their second shift after their, their work. And we know that that burden falls primarily to women. So how are we aware of the different ways that people are showing up and having objective um, performance measures is really important to keep that playing field level. Um, and then I will just give one, because I bet you guys had not think, thought of this, but in terms of an inclusive workspace, one thing that I embarrassed, I'm embarrassed that I did not know earlier because I've been a bureau director for 18 months and I've been with the bureau for almost seven years. Um, I didn't know how difficult it was for our field staff to find a restroom in the wild, right? They were coming back to our interstate facility because that's where there were bathrooms. And that's where there were bathrooms that um, I think anyone would wanna use if you have to sit down on a toilet. So sometimes it just comes down to these really practical issues. If you are not providing the facilities that people need, then they will have to make other arrangements and that can affect their work um, and uh, how they progress in an organization. So something just really as fundamental as that is something that we have to be looking for as leaders so that we're supporting people from every level. Thank you, Gay. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, Mia, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I think a lot has been said. I don't know how much I can add. I really appreciate all these insights. Um, I guess for me, it's ensuring uh, that there is space for the presence and for the voices to be heard. Um, a lot of times, you know, even if you're not in a supervisory position as you're in the meeting, you know, ensure that everybody has a comfortable space and that they can voice their opinions without being spoken over or um, just brushed aside. I think that goes to all of us. And then um, I guess in terms of um, leadership, I always try to approach it from very much human-centered um, aspects. So engaging with your staff, female or male, building those relationships and building trust. Uh, I think Tiffany said that. Um, and then also as part of that is really sharing the vision of the program and how they will contribute to that end vision, you know? So not only currently how they add to the vision of the program, but how they can actually uh, build in the future. So let's say you have a technician working for you, right? And if their goal is to be an engineer, right? Then I think it's up to the supervisor to really build that strategy with that employee and say, all right, so here, here's the overall program vision and here's your journey where you wanna be, where you feel you'll be the happiest. So then let's merge the two and come up with some key milestones in terms of the training or what you're gonna need for your next you know, job interview, what skills are they gonna be seeking? And then let's make sure that we create some stretch projects within our program, you know, that will really be those um, great things that you can bring to the next interview, you know? I, I'm, I'm kind of like Gabe, I, I think that uh, being a supervisor is kind of like a being a parent, is like always trying to, to enable your staff to excel and, and be happy in what they do, because I think it's so much easier to manage inspired and happy staff than it is to micromanage staff that doesn't feel attached to what uh, the end vision is or how they fit in that space. So really creating the space for everybody. And then really, if you have the control and you are the supervisor, make sure that, that you understand where is that happy spot for that employee and where they wanna go and that you're creating a pathways for them. Thank you, Mia. I really appreciate your um, Amy? Sure, I, everyone's, um said such such beautiful things i have very, very little to add but i'll just i'll just um sort of reinforce what everyone has already said i, I like to think outside the box with management i, I hate coming into to predetermined structures predetermined structures we know who they exclude and who they don't 
So um, I, I love what Mia said about human-centered. I feel very much the same way. I, I the, the people that I'm in the position of managing, I, I don't, that in and of itself should be flipped. Like my job is to support the people that were hired to do the work. My job is to get things out of their way so they can do the work that they are experts at doing. So I lead from the field. You know, I don't tell my team what to do. I present what challenges we have to solve. I don't delegate, you know, they delegate. They decide, okay, well, so-and-so has got to pick up her kid at so-and-so hour. So what I'm going to do is this. And they solve it. They do it better than I could, you know, I just feel it's so wrong to take all of that expertise and that brilliance that my diverse team brings and not allow them to come up with the solutions. It, it's so short-sighted. So the, 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 the consequence of that is they have more skin in the game. They design, devise the plan. My job is to get things out of their way so they can do the plan. And the, the good part about that is that everyone's life is ac accommodated. You know, if they have scheduling things, if they need to work from home, if they don't need to work from home, they need to work from the office, they figure that out. I get things out of the way. I make that happen. That is my job. And the other unintended consequence, I don't know, it seems obvious, but they, um, they come, up, they come up with better ideas and they're way more invested in the outcome because they know what the outcome is. It's not like, okay, you do this piece, you do this piece and they're, they're working siloed. They are all solving the problem together and they all know more about the problem, you know, the problem, the, the, the challenge, you know, I should say. They all know more about what's going on. They all have better solutions and it also advances each of their skills because they're interfacing so much more. They get to learn what the other person does and their skill sets. They, they get to learn where I can step in and be like, they're like, dude, I need to know what that guy knows because he knows stuff that would help me do my job. I'm like, cool. It's my job to get things out of your way. I'm going to get you a class. You know, they solve all of the problems and they solve it way better than I could as their manager. So I love the idea of letting the team do the work, letting the team grow while doing the work and letting the team decide what is the best way to do the work because I am not the expert they are. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, do we have Commissioner Rubio uh, in yet? Oh, yes. <laughs> Welcome, Commissioner Rubio. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. We have Commissioner Rubio and uh, we want to welcome her so she's gonna um, give us uh, some empowerment words and uh, some support welcome commissioner rubio thank you so much um and good afternoon everyone i just want to thank you for allowing me to pop by really quick and say a few words for you um in the middle of your program um i, I wanted just to stop by and appreciate the tremendous work of the women's empowerment group and the great leadership of the co-chairs, um, Anna and Zoo, as well as all of the panelists today. Um, it's such an esteemed group here. Um, I've been here a year and four months um, now in this new role. And while I'm very, very honored, um, it's also been some ways, uh, some of the most uh, challenging work of my life. Um, and not only just the issues and, and, and you know, uh, the landscape of, of, uh, of uh, what we're going through today as a city, but also um, it's challenging being a woman of color elected in this position um, and issues of bias, sexism, uh, structural racism, uh, while we're all actively working to dismantle these things, every one of us here, um, they're still within the government structures that we work in and there's still so much work to do. And I know that you all uh, know and experience perhaps these things regularly. Um, so I just want to uh, call attention to that and acknowledge that because we have to name that it's still there. And, and this is where we step in to support one another. And to be honest, um, the Tao Commissioner Hardesty and I support one another as the two women on council and why it's important that women and women of color hold leadership positions and key positions throughout the city in bureaus, in city hall and in the community, because our lived experiences provide that critical lens um, that create and shape inclusive policy that leaves no one behind. And as women of color and women leaders, um, we are usually the first uh, to call attention and address these deep disparities and issues of bias because we and, and our, our children often experience these disparities first. Um, and our experiences shape how we lead, it shapes how we manage and what we advocate for. Um, so this is why I just wanted to stop by and deeply appreciate the mission and focus of this work. Um, it's calling out where our work needs to be and continue to be stronger. 
Um, and it also the strength and relationship to support each other's leadership here at the city. So please know that I'm here to learn um, as well as lend my support in whatever ways that I can. And I also would hope that you feel comfortable enough to reach out to me and share your perspectives so that it can help shape my work too. And so my door is always open and will remain so. Um, so I look forward to continuing uh, to support your efforts and I, I hope to become more, inv more involved and active in this group. Um, and I'll step out now. I don't wanna um, disrupt your flow, but I just wanna, again, thank you so much for letting me speak for a few minutes and I hope um, that uh, you all have a wonderful week. Thank you, Commissioner Rio. Uh, we appreciate your in stepping by. Thank you Thank so you. much. Have a good day. <laughs> um, so now we're going to be opening for questions. Um, if anybody, uh, Linda, do we have any questions in the chat? At the moment, I don't see any questions. Um, but while we wait for questions, I can read off some of the um, notes of appreciation and support that people have been putting in the chat. Um, People are have said thank you so much for your honesty, Tiffany. For the things that you that you were saying previously, um, a lot of people saying really appreciate you know appreciate knowing what's on your mind so we can make improvements. There's so much to unpack and share and learn. I so appreciate your honesty, Tiffany. This rings true for me too. Somebody says yes, thank you, Tiffany. I had very difficult relationships with women in the workforce that were acting in the way that you mentioned, and I'd report it to managers and be told there was nothing that we could do about it. Um, and somebody else says yes, Amy. Assimilation is expected, and it's not the answer. Um, another person says I've also experienced where a man is taking action against a woman that is questionable. It is looked at into looked into more often than when um, than if a woman takes a questionable action against another woman. Um, love that sense of belonging piece um, from another person. Uh, another person says, yes, Gabe, I get that too. Um, I think with uh, reference to the imposter, imposter syndrome and somebody else, oh, are people coming in with some questions here too? Um, somebody else says, um, Yes, the what ifs can go on forever in regards to, I think, flexibility in the workplace and wondering if people are really doing their jobs. Um, somebody else says, thank you all for the excellent sharing, truth telling, authentic revelations. And um, so many gems dropped in today. So refreshing to hear the honest conversations being had. Thank you for holding this space today. I'm definitely leaving feeling inspired. Thank you, Linda. Um, well, it's pretty, we don't have questions. So I will really thank our panelists uh, today for this amazing uh, insight about breaking the bias. Uh, the purpose for this um, event is to bring awareness in the workplace and support, you know, for women, especially women of color. And for the next steps, uh, we will be sending a recording to employees to keep it for a month. So compile questions, if there's any from the audience and try to answer them so you know we will help the panelists. Um, also, we're gonna gather information to share with the WE community. Uh, we're gonna gather, you know, what best practices, tools for breaking the bias. And also notify them that there is a male panel uh, or leaders scheduled for April 25th. So, um, at 1.30 p.m. And it will be also be recorded. So Anna is gonna be the facilitating with uh, Linda and I'll be helping with that chat. So if you all invite and I thank you so very much for, um, for having this amazing conversation and I'll get back to you, Anna, if you wanna say any ending words. No, I'm just so appreciative of everyone showing up in this space. It is a community of employees and leaders and like people keep saying, it's a way to connect, right? It's a, con a way to build relationships and be stronger together. And so this is our initial work through women's empowerment. That's why we're doing a male panel so we can hear what they're saying. And I'm actually thinking of having just a panel of, because I've been hearing that everyone can be a leader and maybe there should be a panel that includes people from all the works across the city. So uh, I think that's probably what we're going to do too. So yes, and take all this information and figure out how can we benefit our women's empowerment community. And we're so 
uh, grateful for the leadership of the city to change policies such as teleworking and flexible work in compassionate approach, people center. So yes, thank you. And, and, and this is with, of course, with the, uh, lead, lead, the leadership from diverse and power employees of Portland, which make, we are now called employees resource groups, employee support groups. So we're not gonna be affinity groups anymore, but our, our work is gonna expand to working with BHR on how to make this the employer choice, right? That we wanna be. So thank you, I'll pass it back to Salem or Linda, if you wanna say something. Uh, Linda, just wanna give you a little bit of opportunity to say a few words. Well, um, I just appreciate everybody being here today. I just think it's so valuable to hear, you know, everybody's experiences. And I keep seeing people are um, keep commenting on the chat about, you know, this is great. Let's have more meetings like this and let's let's share our experiences and support each other. And so, um, you know, I hope that we can continue. And I just really appreciate the, the um, time of the panelists today. So thank you very much. Well, this is the end of our event and thank you so much finalists. Thank you for your support for the women's empowerment and um, hopefully to have you uh, in another event. Thank you so very much and have a great, great afternoon. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye,